Hey, thank you for coming tonight. I want to talk about the best version yet. The best version yet. And I had this thought uh, while we were standing there worshiping uh, and just thinking about how grateful I am that you guys would give us uh, a few minutes of your Thursday night. I know it's, you know, you got to break a routine and get out here on Thursday. I do think it's pretty cool, though I have to say, I'm here Monday night. I'm leading a, a, a young men's discipleship group on Monday night rock group, and there's other rock groups meeting here and celebrate recovery. And like the parking lot is packed. It's Monday night. You know, and then last night, the, the worship teams are practicing, and there's groups meeting again all over church, and then, I mean, Tuesday night, and then last night, our nation ministry is happening, and then the place is, you know, a bunch of kids, and Jeremiah, and yeah, all together, and, uh, and then here we are tonight, Thursday night, what's going on tomorrow night in this place, but... I'm just saying there's a bunch of life happening, and a lot of lives are being touched every day of the week, but that, that wasn't my thought. This is my thought. My thought was, what if, uh, what if the Lord called Suzette and I to start a new church in Asheville, North Carolina, and what if you were our starting team? What if, what, if, what if this is what, like, what if this is the crew that we had to start a brand new church with, and, I, and, and what if somebody would just say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you guys, because I believe in what you're doing, six million dollars of facility. And we'd, we'd be like, we'd be going, oh my God, would we? Would we? And so my thing is, why don't we have the best church yet, the best year yet, the best rock church ever, like this year? So you, uh, who has taken the time to be here tonight, and I realize there are some people that they just can't be here for, for legitimate reasons, but, uh, but you, you, you carved your way out for tonight, and what if you took the posture of, I am going to be a part of the greatest year yet at the Rock Church. I'm going to be part of the greatest move of God that's ever taken place through the Rock Church. I hope you know that our faith and our passion for what God wants to do in and through our church is as strong as it's ever been. And I am believing that this year is going to be absolutely amazing. It's already been a great year, but it's going to be an even better year. This is going to be a, a crown the year with a bountiful harvest kind of year. So, and... And I just want to say, I hope you, I think you know this, but I just want to remind you, when you get under the covering of a house of God, the blessing that God puts on that house, he puts on your life. So you have full right to, to, uh, to grab a hold of that. Uh, we have a, my wife loves gardens and stuff like that, and um, we have this little bush I took a picture of uh, that's, that's, that's now coming out right now. What's the name of that flower bush? Snowball. That's a snowball bush. So that's a picture of it today. It's not completely bloomed out, uh, and it's, it's just starting to come in. So here's the interesting thing about this little snowball bush, and that is it used to be in another part of our yard, and it, 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 was, it was next to a kind of a small version oak tree, which has now become a large version oak tree in my yard. And this thing started to suffer because the oak tree was being a bully and taking up all the space and the air and the sunshine and the nutrients. So we took this little bush and uh, we just moved it over to another place in, um, in our state, <laughs> if you will. And, uh, and, 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 and so it has been in this spot for four years, four, four years at least. And I promise you the first year we moved it, it, it didn't look like it was going to make it. It looked like it was not going to make it. The second year, 
it didn't look like it was going to make it. The third year, it's still, in it, like it would, no flowers, no snowballs, just there. But it wasn't quite dead yet. And we just kind of hung in there with that baby and just believed in the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ to touch our snowball bush. And this year's version is the best version yet. And I'm, I'm a, I want you to believe. Now, I, I know that some of you guys are facing things in your world, whether it's uh, health issues or job issues or relationship issues or finance issues or whatever that would make you go, PK, if you knew what I'm facing right now, you wouldn't be trying to encourage me to think about this being my best year yet. You're the very person I want to talk to for a minute and just let you know that the greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world and that there's no weapon that's formed against you that can prosper and that God is going to cause all things to work together for your good. And just this year, come on. You know, when I, when I think back to the real stories of, of our life together, Suzette and I, of our church, I always think back to the hard seasons that God brought us through and brought us out of, and, and I just believe that this 2017 version of you could be the best version yet. This 2017 version of your marriage, I know your marriage has been great till now, But it could be the best year yet. And I just want to believe that your walk with God could be the best year yet. And I want to believe for our church that this could be our absolute best version ever. Why can't the 2017 version of the Rock Church be the best version ever? Now, what I have on, uh, I guess, over you guys is a little, in a little bit is... I've, I've been here since the beginning. So I've seen a bunch of yo-yos come and go. And uh, <laughs> I've seen a bunch of good people come and go. But I just, <laughs> I just think the group of people that we have today that make up our church, because that's what our church is. You, me, us, like who we are, what we do, how we engage, how we extend our heart, our faith. And I'm not talking about like doing more. I'm just talking about being who we really are, right? So why can't this version of our church be the most loving version that's ever existed? You know, why can't this be the most generous version of the rock church that's ever existed why can't this be the strongest version why can't this be the most faith-filled version of the rock church come on we're starting this new church we got to be full of faith right i i think that we could i think we could be the most worshipful loving God wholeheartedly, unashamed, hands in the air, singing to the top, or whatever noise you make to the top <laughs> of your voice, letting God know how much you love him. That, that, this, could be, this could be the best year ever for us. And I think to, to, I think to, to keep us uh, from just going through the motions, because how many of you know it's easy just to yeah. slip into going through the motions? It just is. And to keep us from just going through the motions of church or our business or life or relationships, you got to start with why, and you got to keep remembering why, right? You, you got to keep remembering why. So 2 Peter 1, 12 and 13 says, uh, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them 
and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And that's what I'm here to do tonight is to stir us up by way of reminder. Drift is the natural tendency. It just, it just is. Uh, complacency is the natural tendency. Urgency is not the natural tendency, you know, for all of us. It's just, it's just the human nature. You just, you get used to that person you live with and you don't take them for the value that you took them for when you were first trying to win them to yourself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on. And, uh, and I want to take some, some moments tonight and talk about the values of our church because values shape culture. And whatever we value ultimately forms the, the culture of our church, our home, our business, of our nation, the things we really value. Culture is maybe one of the most important things that can ever exist in an organization because culture eats strategy for lunch. So, so when, if you have a great strategy, but you have a dysfunctional culture, where you, you, know, you maybe have backbiting or you know, at work or you have gossip or you have negativity or you have people that are just dragging their feet or maybe pulling even in another direction. How many of you know you can have a fantastic strategy, but if that's trying to put into, that into effect within a dysfunctional culture, it's never going to work. It is never going to work, no matter how great the strategy is. But I will, I will say this, because I know it's true, that you don't even need a, a great strategy, a decent strategy, some kind of strategy, but even a decent strategy that's within a healthy, vibrant culture is always going to flourish. So, so owning culture is, is, a, is a vital thing for our church, uh, for it to be everything that God wants it to be. You know, you've heard the saying, I'm sure, vision leaks, yeah. right? You know, uh, and so we forget why. We drift away from why. We, we get complacent about why. But I also want to say that values leak. Yeah. And... Uh, and and so we can forget our why. We can forget what this, what we're really trying to build. And I think we need constant reminders, just like the passage I just read in First Peter. That we need constant reminders to stir us up. Reminders of our vision. Reminders of our mission. Reminders of our value. It's a necessity. Now, our ushers are going to hand out right now a, uh, a little card that's got a few pieces of information on it that uh, I just want to take a few minutes tonight and, and talk about. Uh, we, used to, we used to teach, um, you know, some of you may have been around long enough for when our Vision of the Rock class, uh, which is now starting point, used to be 13 weeks long. That's right, 13 weeks. People who really love Jesus came to that. And, uh, and there was only actually four people that graduated from the 13 week. But it, gave, it did give us an opportunity to, to teach the values of our church in a, in, a, in a great way. And we even used to try to teach our, the values of our church in starting point. But, uh, but now we've tried to shorten up starting point because it was just getting to be this marathon meeting. And we just, we just had to decide what should go. So uh, we, we, we teach about the mission of the church, but we don't teach the values. And... Um, I, I realize that, that we don't get to talk about the values of our church very much. This group that's here tonight, this kind of group, is, is going to be the group that is actually going to uh, own the values of our church. So in other words, values are meaningless, even though they're well-worded and well-thought-out, just written on a piece of paper. Values matter when they are lived, and, and not even perfectly, but just lived out, just engaged in, just kind of a lean into it. And so uh, I'm, I'm on a mission 
for a season, and I, I haven't gotten everything in place about how we can keep the values in front of our church on a more consistent basis in a better way. We used to have our values on a board in the, you know, our, our mission statement, our vision statement, our values uh, all out on a board out in the front of the church. And we, that was several years ago, we took that down. And I don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but I am right now on a mission to, for us to take our values and really live them and, and go with them. So let me walk you through this for a minute because I realize some of you guys have, ne- some of this stuff you've never even heard. Now, our mission is love God, live people, change the world. Now, I maybe you heard that one. Yeah, everybody, I think everybody's heard that one, right? And so, so in our uh, Twitter-fied world, uh, we realized that we probably needed to, con- you know, take everything and kind of boil it down to as uh, compact as possible. So that would be a mission for us. Our vision statement, which we don't really throw out that often anymore, but I, I just, I happened to see this a while back and I'm thinking, you know, this is exactly what we're trying to do. This is it. Our vision is to build a large, regional, life-giving church that touches thousands of people, not torches, but touches. (laughs) We're here to torch thousands of people. (laughs) And lifts them to higher levels of life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and through renewed biblical mindsets. There, so we're here to, to, to lead people to Jesus, but we're also here to change some minds about God's way because God's way is the right way and the best way and the highest way to live. So here's our, here are, we have 10 vision uh, statements and, and I just want to read through them, and then I'm actually going to kind of walk through this a little bit tonight and just talk about this. Value number one is we love to stay connected to heaven through prayer and worship. Didn't, didn't you love that moment, just uh, us hanging out, worshiping God? We love that kind of stuff around here. Uh, value number two is we realize relationships matter a lot. Value number three, we believe that God wants people to succeed in life, and we want to help them. Value number four is excellence inspires people and glorifies God. Value number five, we are life-giving and not legalistic. Come on, somebody say amen and be glad for that. Now, value number six, generosity is our flow. Think river, not pie. Value number seven, we are fishing in the ocean, not maintaining an aquarium. Value number eight, God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. Because all committees can do is manage. We love leaders and leadership. Value number nine, we love the next generation. We do. We love them. And no matter how expensive and how much trouble they are, we love them. No, that's not, I, we love them. And we value the previous generations. Amen. I can say this to you guys, right? But we, like, we love the next generation, but they can't pay for anything. <laughs> Nothing. They can't even buy lunch when you go out with them. It's like, I've never, I've never gone out with a young person that said, I'll pay. They're always just waiting for PK to pull out the card, and, and I do it. So, so we love you guys. We love your energy, but we value previous generations, especially the ones who get it and understand what we're doing. And value number 10 We embrace people just like they are, then we help them grow into all they can be. That's what discipleship is. 
That, that is discipleship. So I want to take a few minutes and, and, and walk through all this. And I just, I just want to say that if, as I look through this, this mission, this vision, these values, that is a pretty awesome church to me. Amen. That is a pretty awesome church. And, and my encouragement to us tonight is if we are going to be the best version yet, that is going to be us not only going, that's a cool way to say it, or that's a, that's a great idea. It's actually us going, yeah, generosity is my flow. Yeah, relationships matter, and I am not just going to slip out of church as soon as the meeting is over. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's going it, it, to, this, this lived is, gonna, is an incredible place. So let me talk about our vision for just a minute, because I, I realize that I haven't even talked about this vision statement for years since we kind of did the, the condensing to love God, lift people, change the world. And uh, I remember we were going through this in, our, in a staff development session, and Jeremiah, who's heading up our student ministry now, been here for six years, right? came on Easter Sunday six years ago. Heather says, thank you, Jesus, right? <laughs> came on Easter Sunday six years ago. So, so I don't know, any of you guys that aren't married, you don't know who just came to church this past Easter. That's, could, be, could be somebody just for you. Keep praying, <laughs> believing, watch and pray. <laughs> Our vision is to build a large, regional, life-giving church that touches thousands of people and lifts them to higher levels. Now, can I tell you, we have already touched thousands of people. There's no question that, you know, that's taking place. But I'm talking about having thousands of people together at once. That, that's, 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 where, that's where our vision is. And I'm grateful for, for all the thousand yo-yos and good people that have come through the church. But, uh, but I just believe God's got something bigger and better and more for us. Um, and touches thousands of people and lifts them to higher levels of life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through renewed biblical mindsets. I, I, I want us to understand that we're not just trying to be large for large sake. Large means a lot of people are being reached. Large, large means that there are thousands of individuals with all with stories of their own, all with broken hearts of their own, all with dreams of their own, all with aspirations of their own that are being touched by the gospel. And, and once they're being touched by the gospel, they're having their mind renewed to see how good God really is. And I just want to remind us that a large church is not just an enlarged version of a small church. A small church, a church that's under 200 people, is, is kind of a setup where everybody knows everybody, everybody has access to the pastor personally at all times, and, and I'm not saying I don't want to have access or have people have access to me, but what I am saying is that a large church is not just the same thing as a small church that's made bigger. It's a whole different thing. It's an entirely different thing. A large church requires multiple staff, um, and, and it, it just takes that kind of thing to, to, to really meet the needs of a large church. The thing about a large church that we are in right now in this moment is this, is that a large church realizes that they have facility needs because, you know, when, when you've got just you and your wife, when Suzette and I first got married, we lived in a, in a little one-bedroom apartment. But, you know, once you've got kids, and, once, and, and if we were to have more than two kids, we didn't, but if we were to have more than two kids, I mean, you know, you got to enlarge the tent. <laughs> you got to. And so, so I'm listening to a podcast the other day, and the guys are talking about what does it take for a church to, to break through to certain levels. And they said, the first thing that we try to help these guys understand is that if you're going to reach a lot of people, you're going to have to take care of parking. If you're going to reach a lot of people, you're going to have to have a lobby that is as large as your sanctuary. 
You know, if you're, if you're going to reach a lot of people, you're going to have to realize that there's got to be lots of rooms for kids and lots of space for all kinds of things to happen. Well, that's what we're doing right now. And somebody might go, well, gosh, Pastor, do we really need a bigger lobby? And, and the truth is, it's not just a bigger lobby. It's, it's a vision. I mean, it's people. It's connecting. It's touching. It's, it's, it's helping people connect with that. And so, so and the, I think this whole concept of large regional, not just neighborhood church, but reaching out to our whole region, which we do some, but I think we can do well, and, or do better even. And then, you know, I, I love this idea because I, I think sometimes churches try to get, they either are so, um, not shallow, that's not the right word, but they're all evangelistic and nobody gets taught anything, or they get taught all the time, and they just get fat and lazy. Thank God that's not happening here, right? But, but I, I just want you to know that our church has a passion to lead people to Jesus. I mean, we really do. And, and we're all about that. And, and we are not just trying to create, you know, Christians with tons and tons and tons of knowledge. We are, we are literally trying to lead people to Christ. But then we want people to understand that the Bible has a way to live, that whether it concerns your, your sexuality or your morality or your finances or your marriage or the way you raise your kids, the Bible's got clear instruction for how to live abundantly in, in those areas. God has a higher life for all of us, and if we could get a hold of his higher thoughts, his higher thoughts will lead us to higher ways. Amen. So value number one, let's talk about value number one for a minute. That's our vision statement. Uh, value number one is we love to stay connected to heaven through prayer and worship. This is what I want to, this is what I want to encourage us to own uh, together. The, you're the core group. You're, you're here. You're, we're planting this church. This church is going to be full of awesome worship. And that worship is not just going to be led by the people up here. That church is going to be led by us. You and me. Like, thank you for coming tonight to audition for the worship team. You are, you are the worship team. You are the worship team. You got it? You are the worship team. Whatever I love when our kids are up here jumping and dancing and loving Jesus and excited and, and going for it, checking each other out. I mean, just worshiping God. And I love what's going on up here. I, I love it. But I'm just saying the spirit of that needs to be in us. Come on, let's not just let the kids be excited about Jesus and love Jesus. We all love Jesus. We all want to worship God. And I don't, I don't, I, you know, I know it's loud for some people, but we, I don't ever want to be this kind of lame, tame, milquetoast kind of church. It's, it's like, whatever, I just want us to worship God with all of our hearts. And I, when Greg and I went to England together a, a couple of years ago, one of the churches that we went to, they literally had a, a worship choir. Their, their stage wasn't big enough to, to accommodate a worship choir. So they had, these, they, had, they had this seating right up front where their worship choir sat. And it's like it just created this energy. And I thought sometimes we ought to do something like that. Well, this is it. Okay, this is it. You are being invited to be on the worship team now. Amen. We're, and we're, we're not giving you a mic, but, uh, but we are calling on you to worship God. And let me, just, let me just encourage us to understand. We love to touch heaven through prayer and worship. Uh, let me just encourage us to own the value of a praying church. Uh, you know, all, all great moves of God throughout history have all been preceded by a massive prayer movement. There, there's, and, and what it's going to make, you know, like we work hard, and I think most of you guys can tell, we work very hard on our systems and our organization, and, and we should. 
do all of that kind of stuff. But that is not, this world doesn't need better systems. This world needs a move of God. This world needs a touch of heaven. Our church needs a touch of heaven. Asheville needs a, a church with a touch of heaven on it that, that the Spirit of God can flow through and touch our city. And I'm just saying, there's too much trouble in this world right now. There's too much division. There's too much violence. There's too much stuff going on for us just to go, ah, you know, I'm not going to get all that worried about it. I'm just going to stay home and watch whatever. And, and I want to say that I, I know we are doing the best we can, and we're going to keep doing as good as we can to reach the next generation, but the percentage of millennials and younger that are believers is continuing to decline in our society, and we just need a move of God. So, so we do, we pray 7, uh, not 7.45, 8.45 um, uh, on Sunday mornings. If you can make that even just once a month or something, just be a part of it. And then we have, a, we have, a pr- we have two prayer seasons, 21-day prayer seasons in January to start the year, and then August as we gear up for the fall. And I'm just asking you even now, we, we put the dates for prayer season in. If you would just you know, carve out some time and say, I'm going to be here. We're probably still going to do what we did last year, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings, then Tuesday, Thursday night, and just say, you don't have to be at all of them unless you want to be, unless you really love Jesus. Uh, I mean, if you, <laughs> unless you want to be. Uh, you know, I understand you can't make all five, and, and Suzette and I are at all five if we can be, for sure, And but would you make two or three of them, you know, I mean, would you make five or ten of 20, there's what, there's 15 of those times, uh, three weeks, 21 days, just, and just put it, in, just even now, just own it and say, come on, our nation, our church needs a move of God. Amen. Amen. All right, value number two is that relationships matter a lot. And, I, and I'm not going to take a lot of time on this one because I just took a, too long on the first one. But relationships matter a lot. The reason we have rock groups is to help people get connected. And I find that adults have a hard time really making new friends are really connecting with new people, especially men. Once men get over 25 years old, they, they are, really don't have any, any real friends other than the ones they had from high school. And, and if those guys are hellions, you're not going to want to keep hanging with them too long, right? So rock groups are, but your relationships are so important. Church is not a meeting you go to. Church is a lifestyle you share. That's all I want to say about that. Value number three is God wants people to succeed in life. We want to help. Uh, and uh, let me just go through that one. Sc- scroll up a little bit. I-, I don't think I want to spend a whole lot of time on that one right now because I don't think that's, uh, I think we get it, right? We know God wants, we want people to be healthy, whole, strong, vibrant, live in life, confident, and not just going to heaven, but a great life here on the earth. And I believe that's God's will. We want to help people get there. Value number four is that excellence inspires people and glorifies God. Anybody love a spirit of excellence? Come on, it, it, we do. It, 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 it's not opulence. It's just a, yeah, this is done right. Excellence is, let's read this together. Excellence is being our best, doing our best, giving our best for the glory of God. Let's say it again. Excellence is being our best, doing our best, giving our best for the glory of God. Excellence costs more, <laughs> right, than mediocrity, but it's worth it. Excellence costs more time. Excellence costs more effort. Excellence costs more financial resources. All right, value number five, which I love, is the fact that we are life-giving and not legalistic, which, which, is, which is not to say everything goes and, and anything goes, you know, grace is not a cover-up for, for just all kinds of silly behavior. There are some things that the Bible says is right. There are some things the Bible says is wrong. I always want to lean to the grace 
side of dealing with that because I know we're all humans and I have my struggles and you have yours and everyone has theirs and I want to be gracious and and but there are rights and wrongs but we can't we can be life-giving we can be inspirational we can be we believe in you God believes in you your life can be great there's enough negativity there's enough condemnation already in this world there's probably Probably enough negativity and condemnation in your own head right and we just want to inspire people to greatness in life value number six is generosity is our flow think river not pie so a generous culture is a culture that is full of generous people generous in all arenas of life when it comes time to, to share, you know, one of, the, the be, one of the best marriage advice things I ever heard, the guy said, if you're cooking eggs for you and your wife and one of the yolks breaks, you eat that one and give the good one to your wife. And I thought, that probably sums up how to have a great marriage right there. Just put that in every arena of your life. Wives, it also applies to you too, right? <laughs> But generosity is, is built out of a conviction that God is a God of abundance. And until you really believe that there's a river, you're going to hold on to your pie. You, 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 you can't let go. You, but I mean, and let's face it, sometimes it's just out of pure, I got to take, I got to be responsible i have to take care of my bills i got to take care of my family i got to take care of the stuff that you know that i'm supposed to be uh, responsible for but until you get a revelation that god is a god of abundance you're going to be holding on to your pie and any and any attempt to ask you to release some of that pie is going to be met with mm. and and i'm just i'm just saying to you Somehow, the revelation has to come to all of us that there's always more to come. Always, if we will release what we have. Because if we don't release what we have, we get to become constipated Christians. And God wants to flow through us, but he can't because we're all stopped up. I'll just leave it at that. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous man will be prosperous. He who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 22.9 says, He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. Now, I, you know that we are going at this from a life-giving, non-legalistic point of view, but I, I am a firm, firm, firm believer in the value of honoring God with tithe. I think it's, it's not just about our money, really. It's about our heart, putting God first, absolutely first, above our house payment, above our car payment, above clothes, food, anything. Put God first. And if you seek first the kingdom of God, everything gets added to you. I'm just, I'm just stirring you up by reminder. Just, I'm just like, I'm, I'm like Peter, the apostle, right? The, an independent study that we did on our church as we were getting ready for some of the building we were going to do came in that 13% of our church is paying tithe. That seemed awful low to me. Uh, and I thought, oh, my gosh. And, and thank God we've been able to do what we've been able to do with 13%. But I just think we can do better uh, as, as a church. And, and so I'm encouraging us like, you know, I've been talking about this 1% improvement thing. I'm going to talk about it again Sunday, but I don't know. If maybe you're not ready to do 10% yet, but g start somewhere and move to 10%. You know, I mean, I'm the, I can't ever back away from the tithe belongs to the Lord, and, and, and there's nothing in me that can actually go. I'm just, okay, 6% is good. It's better than nothing. It is good. It is better than nothing, but it's still not the tithe. If you can hear what I'm saying. 
And then, and then my other thing is, is or, or maybe one other thing is, is I'm, I'm really, I, I, I'm trying to find the way to coach our church into having a spirit of generosity towards guest ministry that comes to our church. When we met at the shopping center, uh, we had a three or 400 people come into church uh, at that time, and we used to, people used to love to come to our church because I had guys say, your church is so generous, you make up for four or five churches that we, we go to. And I'm thinking to myself, our church is three or four times the size of what our church was back in the shopping center, but we are not doing really well with our offerings for guest ministry. So we got a guy like Paul Scanlon, who is like world-class guy that God is sending to Candler. And, and, and our church's uh, giving towards his ministry is not really that good at all. And I'm just, I, I'm just saying, you know, we've got a, this, this spirit of generosity, this flow of resource. And I, I mean, I, I'm, I couldn't give you numbers because it's not right. It's not fair for me to say. But I just want to say that Suzette and I have lived this generosity thing, this tithe and way beyond tithe and mega generous to endeavor at every guest that ever comes. And I cannot, I cannot tell you how blessed we are. So I am not just talking about a, uh, you know, a thing, a theory. I am talking about this will change your life if you own it. And so it's got to happen. And then our Endeavor project that's coming up. Uh, so I am asking our church to bring the best Endeavor offering they've ever brought. And I'm asking each individual in our church to prayerfully consider bringing the best Endeavor, even if it's a, a couple of dollars more than the, than the best you've ever brought. Because if we're going to be the best year yet the most generous yet, then that is going to be us doing this endeavor thing in a big way. So as I've been uh, praying Psalm 65 every morning, I've also been praying Deuteronomy uh, 28. And because uh, I, I uncovered this when I was talking about the rain factor. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. I love that promise. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And I don't know if this ever happens to you. I'm sure it does. You're, you're reading, you're praying the word, you're, and, and all of a sudden there's just something that, that you, your spirit goes, oh, Yeah. Right? You've got that faith thing that rises in you, and that, that I want to take a hold of that. And I put that scripture back up there, if you would, please. Uh, and I'm praying this thing, and, you know, for us to build the project that we have to build, unless our church really comes through in, in, a, in a pretty significant way, we're going to have to end up borrowing money. Now, I'm not against borrowing altogether. If we didn't borrow to build this building, we'd still be in the shopping center, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is a $2 million project just itself, just this building, which is paid for, praise God. Um, but, uh, but uh, I, I don't know if I could ask you to join your faith with me to believe that we just wouldn't have to borrow any money at all and just cash me outside, you know, just, just how about that, right? Okay. Value number seven. Let's move in. Quick, quick. We are fishing in the ocean, not maintaining an aquarium. Uh, Easter, I I'm just saying to you, I know we all have families, we all have stuff, but if I could just ask you to, to shift your mindset to, to realize how valuable the Easter opportunity is. And, and I mean, if we really want to reach people for Christ, people will come to church on Easter. They just will. 
and, and to own it and serve and make it a big piece. And then Christmas Eve, I know Christmas is family, but, you know, we taught our girls growing up, we, this is what we do. We serve the house of God. We serve the purpose of God. We put a lot of time in. And I don't think they ever felt like they were left out for Christmas. They didn't get a Christmas day, Christmas gift, Christmas stuff. They got all their stuff. Fall kickoff Sunday, you know, there's days. That, and even this year, we, we're trying to reposition Mother's Day so that because, you know, for years we used to say about our church, this ain't your mama's church, but on Mother's Day this year, this is your mama's church. <laughs> And uh, this, is, <laughs> this is your mama's church. It's like, like, we're just thinking, what a way to bless. Because, you know, moms have that secret guilt gift that they can use on their, come on, it's Mother's Day, come to church with me. And, and so we're, trying to, we're just trying to seize every opportunity we can to reach people for Christ. But I, just, I want you to know, every Sunday... It's somebody's first Sunday. Every Sunday, somebody has given their life to Christ. You don't know what the miracle that's starting in somebody's life. 13 people this past Sunday, 55 people Easter weekend. And I'm just saying that, that we, we, we got to realize we're not just here to maintain the aquarium. Right? Value number eight, uh, God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. Uh, we love leaders and leadership. And I just want to say, uh, remind us again, nothing happens without a leader. Uh, our ongoing work in Nicaragua is because of a man named Mike Bolster, who has led this thing, who loved it, led it. Honestly, if he didn't love it and lead it, it would, it would have died. It would have died years ago, because, but there was somebody to lead it. If there's going to be a good rock group, somebody got to lead it. If there's going to be a good two-year-old class, somebody got to lead it. If there's going to be a good youth ministry, somebody got to lead it, right? If, you're gonna, if we're going to plant this church like we're talking about tonight, somebody got to lead this thing, right? If, yeah, if you're going to start a business, if you're going to keep your business going, hey, if you're going to have a party, somebody's got to lead it. Right? And I, I'm confessing that I don't feel like we're doing as well as we can on the leadership pipeline of our church. And, it, and I am putting a lot of attention on it and because I, I, don't, I think we can do a lot better in training and developing and raising up our, our leaders. We're leaning into this. Value number nine is we love the next generation. You know that, and I'll have to remind you of all that. We spend a, a lot of energy, time, money, effort on them. We value previous generations. Value number 10, we embrace people just like they are, and then we help them grow into all that they can be. This is, this is discipleship. Let me just say, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, there's somebody younger than you, newer than you. And you might think, I don't know everything. You don't have to know everything. You know more than they know. You know what you know. You know your testimony. You know your thing. And, and I'm just, what's one of the reasons we do these rock groups? And you know, like Ryan reached out to, I don't know, what could have potentially been 120 rock groups within our church and so many people just don't have the time to or don't or whatever i don't know what it is but i'm thinking this is your way to invest in somebody this is your way to disciple somebody it's your way to build a relationship There's, and i know it's time and time is a big ask no, i understand that but but i'm i'm just saying this whole thing about discipleship i think all of us ought to own the concept of discipleship. There's somebody I can invest into. There's somebody I can put my arm around their shoulder and tell them, I believe in you. I see something on your life. I want to help you. God, let's go get a coffee. Let's go grab a lunch. Let's get in a rock group together, whatever. But, but it's value for our church. And can you imagine what would happen in our church if, if all of us, the, this planting team, would start to reach around and say, I'm going to put my arm around somebody and disciple them and help them, help them grow and help them become everything God called them to be. Second Peter 1, let me go back to it. Uh, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though they already, even though you already know them, 
You've been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. Almost daily, and I mean almost literally daily, I am praying Psalm 65 every morning. And I have gotten to where now I am, I am this little thing here outside of the torching thousands. Uh, I, I, am, I am reading this, praying this every day. I'm asking you to do the same, would you? Uh, just put it, put it on your fridge, put it somewhere, and just start to pray it. Start to believe God. Come on, let's lean into this thing, and let's see God do something great. Let's all stand together. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing, and then I'm going to pray one more time. Father, we come to you tonight, and um, we just thank you that you would entrust your church into our hands. We, we are so inadequate for carrying the glory of God. We are so inadequate for, for reaching people with the love of God. But whatever we have and whatever we don't have, we just give it to you tonight again. We just we remind ourselves of why we do this. Why are we doing this this church? Why are we here, Lord? And, and I'm praying for every person that is here tonight, a new fire, a, a new passion, a new desire uh, in reaching the lost and worshiping you and being used of you. God, here we are, Lord. Take us, use us, pour your spirit out on us, glorify your name through our lives. Let's sing together and, and worship, and then I want to pray one more prayer, and then we'll be done.